God's love is our hiding place, the one who protects us in times of trouble. God's love surrounds us with songs of deliverance whenever we are afraid. The love of God chases any shadow away. The love of God dawns with the morning sun. Birds sing their melody and daffodils sway in the song of God's love. Everything on earth praises the God of love. Mountains shout and waves crash. Even thunder declares your love, O Lord. May we join our voices in the song of the ages. Together, this song of God's love becomes our protective hiding place. As deep cries out to deep, we sing, Come, Lord Jesus, come with your love. Amen. Good morning, our Kitty United Methodist Church. It is good to be with you in service this morning. My name is Bethany, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I wanted to welcome you to our YouTube service. Um, as we are looking forward towards gathering together again, hopefully in the coming weeks, months ahead. A few announcements I have before we get going today. Uh, Tuesday, we will be meeting in the back of Carol's yard uh, where we get to enjoy a time of fellowship and connection. We get to pray with each other and share, share in just that love and fellowship with each other. So if you'd like to join us for that, that will be Tuesday. We have our Thursday Bible study this Thursday at 6.30 on Zoom. If you need any help signing up for Zoom or you have any questions about it, please email or uh, call Jason and he can get you that figured out. Um, and all of that information is on our website as well. Uh, and we will be looking towards having a um, Good Friday gathering. Uh, I'm pretty sure it will be on a YouTube like we did last year but we'll also be doing a sunrise service for Easter, and then we'll have a YouTube service as well. So you can look for that in the email in the, in the days ahead. Uh, we'll make sure to put that out there for y'all. Um, our Psalm today comes from Psalm, I gotta grab my Bible and open that up to where we are in our Psalms this week. So the Psalm that I've been sitting in this week is Psalm 32. And it says here, and this is the one that I pulled from for our call to worship that we just showed a minute ago. Uh, the psalmist says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through all my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Ah, Psalm 32, 1 to 7. It's such an important psalm to be sitting in during this fifth Sunday of Lent, where we're reminded of God's continual presence in the midst of this wilderness season. On that, let us sing to the Lord these songs that Justin has prepared for us. One of the songs is a song out of, it's, it's not a song, it's a prayer out of our hymnal, a Lenten prayer. And Justin has put it to music for us and has created a space for us to sing that together today. So will you join me in singing this morning? Oh God, our deliverer, you led your people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land God, now the people of your church that following our Savior we may walk through the wilderness of this world so the glory Oh 
fainting flesh can't bear it Flee as night before the sun At Christ's words the demon trembled From its victim madly rushed While the crowd that was assembled Stood in wonder stunned and hushed Lord, the demon still are thriving In the gray cells of the mind Tyrant voices shrill and driving Twisted thoughts that grip and bind Doubts that stir the heart to panic Fears distorting reason's sight Guilt that makes our loving frantic Dreams that cloud the soul with fright Silence, Lord, the unclean spirit In our mind and in our heart Speak your word that when we shall depart. Clear our thought and calm our feeling, still the fractured warring soul. By the power of your healing, make us faithful, true, and Thank you for that, Justin. Uh, thank you for preparing that music for us to sing with you and sing with each other in the sacred spaces of our homes and the places that we live in today. Uh, we're going to go into our time of joys and concerns. If you would like to uh, add any to these, please let me know before Saturday so that way I can get them into our uh, weekly worship gathering on YouTube. So uh, will you pray with me today? And as we pray, Will you also repeat, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer? And will you also pray the Lord's prayer with me when we get to that part of our prayer time? Let's pray together today, friends. Lord Jesus, whew, thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for this, these spaces that we have, this past year that we have created these sacred spaces in our homes around our family and our friends, around the people we live with and the people we love and some of the people that are a little hard to love. We know that your presence is with us in those spaces and in these places. Jesus, we pray a blessing over this time of being in your word and listening to your message today. But God, right now we do ask that you will be with all that are all those that are affected by the murder of eight people in Atlanta, Georgia. We pray against racism and hatred. We pray against any forms of Christian supremacy, white supremacy, anything that is hatred towards others. We pray against that in your name, Jesus. We pray for your peace for your justice, for your mercy to be seen throughout every area of all those who are affected by these horrible, horrible killings. So we pray these things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, we pray right now over our bishop and her cabinet that you will continue to guide them and direct them as they guide and direct our church and our and our conference and, um, and this denomination. So for them, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Antonio, who is experiencing, experiencing extreme discomfort, extreme discomfort because of bowel issues right now, we pray that you will open up his bowels and allow him to release whatever he is holding on to. So for Antonio, we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, for Claudia, we continue to give you great thanks for the ways that she has been healing up. We thank you to everyone who has brought books to her or to Jess to bring to her and the ways that we've been able to care for her throughout this time. So for continued healing, we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
And Lord, we continue to pray over all those who we haven't seen in a while, who might feel a little lonely, a little isolated, a little um, detached from our hearts and from our minds. And so, Lord, will you bring them to our minds right now? Will you bring together this person, these people that you would like us to think about and pray for in this moment? So for them, we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Jesus, we thank you for this prayer you taught your disciples as we pray together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you for praying that with me and praying with me. Why don't we take a moment and pass the peace of Christ to each other. You can greet the person sitting next to you or maybe send a text to somebody that maybe it's the person that the Lord placed on your heart just now as you were praying that the peace of Christ would guard their hearts and minds today and always. And as you do that, I want to continue to encourage you to give to our church and beyond this church. We are called to live lives marked by generosity. And so if this is your home church, we always encourage you to be prayerful about how you can give here, uh, but also beyond this place as well, since we can't pass a basket via YouTube. You can find ways to give on our website though, if you are curious about those forms. Friends, we have an interesting way that we're going to be doing service today. Uh, we will be showing a video on the book of Ruth. Uh, you're welcome to turn in your Bible if you'd like, or, you know, it's actually only three chapters, I think. Three very short chapters, four. Four very short chapters in, in the Bible that comes right after Judges and right before 1 Samuel. Uh, and so I would encourage you this week to read the book of Ruth. It's a beautiful book. Uh, the Bible Project has put together a video that we're going to use this morning. It's about five minutes or so, and then I have some thoughts about it afterwards. So why don't you take a moment and watch this video, and then we'll come back together again. The Book of Ruth. It's a brilliant work of theological art, and it invites us to reflect on the question of how God is involved in the day-to-day -day joys and hardships of our lives. There are three main characters in the book, Naomi the widow, Ruth the Moabite, and Boaz the Israelite farmer. And their story is told in four chapters that are beautifully designed. Let's just dive in and see how this all unfolds. Chapter 1 opens with this line, in the days when the judges ruled. And it reminds us of the very dark and difficult days from the book of Judges. And here we meet an Israelite family in Bethlehem, struggling to survive through a famine. And so in search of food, they move on to the land of Moab, Israel's ancient enemy. And there the father of the family dies, and the sons marry two Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. And then the sons, they die too. And so they leave only Naomi and these new daughters-in-law. And so Naomi, she has no reason to stay anymore. And so she tells her new daughters-in-law that she's moving back home. And Naomi, she knows that the life of an unmarried foreign widow in Israel is going to be very hard. And so she compels the women to stay behind. Orpah agrees. But Ruth does not. She shows remarkable loyalty to Naomi. And she says, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your people will become my people and your God will become my God. And so the two of them return to Israel together. And the chapter concludes with Naomi changing her name to Mara, which means bitter in Hebrew. And she laments her tragic fate. 
Chapter two begins with Naomi and Ruth discussing where they're going to find food. And it just so happens to be the beginning of the barley harvest. And so Ruth goes out to look for food. And it just so happens that she ends up picking grain in the field of a man named Boaz, who just so happens to be Naomi's relative. We're told that Boaz is a man of noble character and he notices Ruth. And so after finding out more about her story, he shows remarkable generosity to her. He makes these special provisions so that the immigrant Ruth can gather grain in his field. And in doing so, Boaz is actually obeying an explicit command of the Torah to show generosity to the immigrant and the poor. Boaz is so impressed by Ruth's loyalty to Naomi, he prays for her that God will reward her for her boldness. So Ruth comes home that day, and Naomi finds out that she met Boaz, and she is thrilled. She says Boaz is their family redeemer. Now, this family redeemer thing, this was a cultural practice in Israel where if a man in the family died and he left behind a wife or children or land, it was the family redeemer's responsibility to marry that widow, to take up the land and protect that family. So Naomi, she begins to hope that perhaps there might still be a future for her family. Chapter 3 begins with Naomi and Ruth making a plan to get Boaz to notice their situation. So Ruth is going to stop wearing clothes of a grieving widow, and she's going to show signs that she's available to be married. And so Ruth goes to meet Boaz on the farm that night. And as she approaches, Boaz wakes up and he's totally startled. And Ruth makes her intentions very clear. She asks if Boaz will redeem Naomi's family and marry her. Boaz is once again amazed by Ruth's loyalty to Naomi and her family, and he calls Ruth a woman of noble character. It's the same term used to describe the woman of Proverbs 31. So Boaz tells Ruth to wait until the next day, and he will redeem both Ruth and Naomi legally before the town elders. And so the chapter ends with Ruth returning to Naomi, and they marvel together at all of these recent events. In chapter 4, it all comes together. It turns out, at the last minute, Boaz discovers there is a family member who's closer to Naomi than he is, and he's actually eligible before him to redeem the family. But at the last second, this family member finds out that he's going to have to marry Ruth, the Moabite, and so he declines. But Boaz, remember, he knows Ruth's true character, and so he acquires the family property of Naomi, and he marries Ruth. Ruth. And so just at the beginning, how Ruth was loyal to Naomi's family, so now Boaz is loyal to Naomi's family as well. The story concludes with a reversal of all of the tragedies from chapter 1. So the death of the husband and the sons is reversed as Ruth is married again and gives birth to a new son, granting joy to Naomi. And this symmetry between the opening and the closing, it's even more remarkable. So remember, the opening tragedy was followed by a great act of loyalty on the part of Ruth. And that is now matched by Boaz's act of loyalty that leads to the family's final restoration. And this symmetry, it highlights the design of the internal chapters as well. So each of the chapters begins with Naomi and Ruth making a plan for their future. And that's followed by a providential meeting between Ruth and Boaz. And each chapter concludes with Naomi and Ruth rejoicing at what's taken place. This story is beautifully designed, and that design actually connects with a really interesting feature of the story, and that's how little God is mentioned. Right, The characters talk about God a few times, but the narrator actually never once mentions God doing anything directly in the story, and that's its brilliance. Because God's providence is at work behind every scene of this story, weaving together the circumstances and choices of all these characters. So Naomi, her tragedy leads her to think that God is punishing her. But actually, the whole story is about God's mission to restore her and her family. And he's doing so through Ruth, through her boldness and loyalty, which brings healing to Naomi's life, but not without Boaz, who's a no-nonsense farmer who's full of generosity and loyalty. And so God uses his integrity combined with Ruth's boldness to save Naomi and her family. And so this story brilliantly explores the interplay of God's purposes and will with human decision 
and will. God weaves together the faithful obedience of his people to bring about his redemptive purposes in the world. And that leads to the real end of the story. The book of Ruth concludes with a genealogy, showing how Boaz and Ruth's son, Oved, was the grandfather of King David, from whom came the lineage of the Messiah. And so all of a sudden, these seemingly mundane, ordinary events in this story are woven into God's grand story of redemption for the whole world. And so the book of Ruth invites us to consider how God might be at work in the very ordinary, mundane details of our lives as well. And that's what the book of Ruth is all about. Well, friends, I really hope that video impacted you like it did for me. And I have a few thoughts to continue forth into um, that I hope will be helpful for you. The first is I'd like to invite you to look back on your life for a moment. Think about your life, your accomplishments, the tragedies or trauma that you've experienced. Think about your children and grandchildren. Maybe take a moment to name them in your mind. Some of you have so many grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren, it might be hard to name them all. <laughs> Think about your first job. Mine was at a snack bar. <laughs> I schlepped soda pop and ice cream to people. Think about your favorite job. What was your favorite thing to do? Think about your first kiss, your last kiss, your favorite kiss. <laughs> Think about the health issues you've had throughout your life. Different things that you were disappointed in your body, surgeries. Think about the choirs you were a part of, the, the clubs that you attended, the parties you threw or went to. Think about the volunteer work that you've done. Woo, for some of you, that is a lot of volunteer work, ways that you have served. Think about our church and the committees you've served on, the ways that you have shown up into each other's lives. Now think about the amount of meals you've made. What was your favorite meal that you made? Think about the shirts you've mended, the crafts you've made, the ways that you are present to the people in your life. What we saw in this video is the authors or the, the people that put it together, the Bible project, they said that God's purpose and will connects with human purpose and will. So sometimes we can look at our life and it feels like it's been mundane, ordinary, it's been common. But when you think about the purpose and will that you've had in your life, even if it's simply caring for your children or going to work every week, or connecting with certain people, or being a part of this church community. When we think about those things, sometimes they can feel a little mundane, a little common. Like what we did and what we've done doesn't matter. But what we saw in this video is that the way that our lives, our purpose, our will is actually connected to God's purpose and will because God has been with you throughout every part of every part of your life. God is involved in the common and the mundane details of your life. God has been at work behind every scene. So when we look at the things that we've experienced in our lives, that the tragedies, the traumas, the hardships, the divorces, the death, the, the lack of our bodily functions, all of these different losses we've experienced, this wilderness sort of life that we've lived in so many ways, we can see it as abandonment like Naomi did. 
but we can also look back on it and see how God has been with us, has been involved in every purpose of that, where it's good. We go from abandonment to restoration, bitter to whole. And I think, friends, I think that there is a time in our lives, and I think this is this is a time better than ever because of our this that we've been separated from each other. We've been everything's been out of whack. We've been disoriented through COVID nineteen. We've been off balanced. Everything is a little funky in our lives. So I believe that we are in the perfect time and place to look back on our lives with intention to celebrate and honor what was what you have done, all of those accomplishments, all of the ways that you've shown up again and again, I think we need to look back at those things in that sort of nostalgic way. What I have done for the good of my church, the ways I have cared for my church, all of those, look back, maybe even write them down, make a list, email them to me. I would love, I would love to hear those things from you, my friends. But not only looking back and honoring and celebrating what was, but also recognizing that what was impacts what is and impacts what will be. So sometimes we can look at ourselves and be like, you know what? I'm just tired. I am tired out. I don't have the same kinds of energy as I had before. I am exhausted. And to think about looking forward to like dream up something new for our church or for our community or for my family, that feels exhausting, impossible even. But friends, sometimes we need to look back and celebrate and honor what was to know what is and what can still be. And maybe it's a different form of energy that you can put towards those things, but I believe that there's still energy enough to be dreaming ahead of what our church can be, of what you can be, and the legacy you are leaving behind to your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and those who have never even shown up to our church yet. Your life has significance that you are passing on to other people. Every one of your lives has, has, has had deep significance that you have been passing on to other people all along. And it's not just to your family and and to those that know you personally, but it also goes into the next generations and the generations to come after that. So I want to ask in this Ruth passage, this wilderness Lenten time, what is your legacy? What do you want to pass on as a church? And not just like as a as a structure of or like a form of how to worship God. I think sometimes we get stuck in these sorts of ways of thinking that like, well, I just need to figure out how to how to pass on all these different things that we've done before. I need to pass on the United Methodist women. I need to pass on the acolytes. I need to pass on a choir. I need to pass on Sunday school. I need to pass on a, you know, singing in, in worship or the hymnal or whatever it is. And I think that those are important things that we celebrate and honor, but not so much as the form of worship that we're passing on, but actually the worship of God. Friends, how are you passing on the worship of God in your life? How are you passing on the prayers that you have, the connections you have with Christ and with each other? What are you passing on to the next generation that people are needed? What is outlasting you? This whole thing of Ruth is one of loyalty. And the word that is used throughout the book of Ruth, it's used about five times as this word chesed, which means, it means like a compassionate, loyal, kind love. It's like this all encompassing word on love. And what we see throughout the book of Ruth is that all of these traumas, tragedies, everything that was wilderness inducing was something that God used for good because God passed on that chesed love, that compassionate, kind, loyal, 
love from one generation to the next. So may we do the same in this week ahead, in the months ahead, in the years ahead, as we continue forth in somewhat unknown wilderness walking together. We're going to go into our time of response through the Lord's Prayer or the Lord's Supper. If you want to go get those communion elements, you can pause the video and then come back. Because something that Jesus took that one time in that upper room, that was a time of remembering the Passover meal, continued forth into that moment in that room, and then continued forth in today's moment in your rooms. So may we take that legacy of Christ's body broken for us, and may we move into Christ's joy of resurrection in us, through us, and before us. Let us receive the Lord's Supper together today. I'll be doing communion through Mark chapter 14. It says that while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take it, this is my body. I wanna pray a blessing over this bread in my hands and the bread in all of your homes today. Let me pray a blessing over it and then we'll eat it together. Jesus, I thank you for this bread. I thank you for your body broken for us. I thank you for your incredible presence throughout every area of our lives. Even when we didn't experience your presence, when we couldn't feel you, or we felt like we were truly abandoned by you, Jesus, you are with us. We thank you for the cross. Oh, we thank you for your life given for ours. We pray a blessing over this bread in our hands and the bread in all of our homes. May it nourish us. May it remind us of your incredible chesed love for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's pray and let's eat this bread together. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let me pray. Jesus, I feel like, like one of your disciples. I am one of your disciples. But I bet they sat there with this cup with you next to them, and they wondered what it all meant, what the point of it all was, why you were doing this. And it wasn't until later when they looked back, they could see why you had done this, what you were doing through it. So Jesus, as we drink this cup that represents your blood shed on the, on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, this cup that represents your love poured out for us, May we be reminded of that chesed love, that kind of love that gives us meaning and purpose, that allows us to look back on our lives and know that you have been with us all along. So Jesus, I thank you for this cup. I pray that it will nourish, bless us, and remind us of your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, will you hold out your hands for the blessing? Arcadia United Methodist Church, may you leave here from this worship service today full of that chesed love of God, the kind of love that invades every part of your body, that fills you up from your toes to your head. May you know that that love goes forth before you, behind you, within you, under you, above you, to your right and to your left. And may you know that you have quite a beautiful legacy that you are leaving behind. May you go in God's grace this week and be blessed. Amen. I'll see you later, friends. Love you so much. 
please reach out if there's anything that we can do for you, anything that you might need or any prayer needs that you might have as well. We'll see you next week.